I spent most of my life trying desperately to please other people before I kind of pleased myself. I came out weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you can clip that, Clip I guess. it, yes. <laughs> hey, welcome to A Conversation With. My name is Philip DeFranco, and today I'm very excited because we're having a conversation with Matthew Mercer. Hello, sir. Hi, thanks so much for having me, bud. Thanks for popping on. I, uh, I got really excited. I also, I didn't realize that Apparently, there is a, a big crossover in our audiences, which is why no idea. just completely different worlds. Yeah, but the, the internet is a strange beast, and you know I have a lot of eclectic, weird tastes, so it just makes me feel a little more comfortable to know that other people out there have weird spatterings of interests. Yeah, and because, uh, I don't know, with, especially I've noticed with the podcast, like we get in front of a, a bunch of different people. If we, uh, if someone doesn't isn't familiar with with you now or your body of work uh how would you describe it oh man uh that's always this is the odd answer to every lift driver like what do you do for a living question You're like uh, <laughs> yeah uh oh lift remember that was that was a thing um <clears throat> i would i am a i'm a, a professional voice actor for animation and video games as well as a huge nerd who has somehow turned his love of role-playing games into an online media network with my friends. So that's, that's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> succinctly. <laughs> well, cause, um, would you, would you say that most people know you because of, uh, the voice acting work in general, or would you say, um, it, it's mainly critical role or what's, what's kind of the, the balance there? Huh, that's a good question. Um, uniquely, I would say probably now it shifted a bit. I mean, mm -hmm. voiceover for a long time up until really recent years was a little under the radar. You know, people played games and they enjoyed games, but it, only a certain percentage of gamers would go on IMDb and be like, oh man, who voiced that character? So it was, it was a little niche. Um, that's kind of gotten bigger and bigger as the years go on. Uh, but Critical Role has definitely become its own unexpected beast that's garnished a much larger audience than any of us have expected. And probably a lot of people that didn't know that we also did voiceover in a lot of the video games they played. So they both kind of dovetailed in, in a very unique fashion. So I'd say Critical Role probably has the the larger reach, oddly. Yeah. And, and so if someone's unfamiliar with Critical Role, what's, what's that? I know that you kind of touched on it. No worries. So Critical Role began about six years ago. Um, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since high school. It's I think role playing games are one of the best kind of imaginary creative experiences you can have with friends. And so it's been a big part of my life. And I got a bunch of people who also did voiceover to come play a game uh, with me. And a lot of them had never played before. And they were very much like, all right, we'll see what this is like. They fell in love with it. We started playing privately at home for a couple years. It became like a big bonding experience for us. And then we had an opportunity through a friend of ours, Felicia Day, uh, to go stream it on her channel on YouTube at the time, Geek and Sundry. And we were like, nobody will watch. People sit around a table for three hours and edited, just talking in silly voices and making up stories together. Uh, but we'll give it a shot. And we were very wrong. And now we it's exploded into, um, we have a weekly live stream that we do on our Twitch channel on Thursdays. We have a bunch of ancillary content where my wife is the creative director that produces and develops all this content. She's amazing. Um, we also have a bunch of comic books through Dark Horse now. We have uh, an upcoming animated series with Amazon that we kickstarted that blew up. So it's been just one progressive what is happening after the next and we're just trying to hold on. <laughs> I can't even imagine what it's like because so I'll say uh, the first time see it was weird because like I, I was aware of Geek and Sundry and then I think there was there were a lot of people like myself that were kind of like more normies that became hyper aware because you had that really, really successful fundraise mm -hmm. uh, where you were looking what for several hundred thousand dollars. And then was it eleven million dollars you guys raised? Or was it more? over eleven million dollars? Yeah. Is that is that more exciting or is that more stressful? Because <laughs> that's eleven million dollars of fan money and that's so much weight on you. It's both. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it. It starts off really exciting, you know, and it's yeah. just seeing all the support and so like thankful and blown away that people care enough about this thing that we were hoping would work to just support it to that degree. And then the bigger it gets, the more you're like, oh, OK, uh, well, we have to make up more stretch goals, which we have to then fulfill. <laughs> uh, oh, now we have to make a whole series. Uh, our, our release date is now completely incorrect. Because now we have, you know, four to five times, if not more, the effort and, and team size that we have to develop for this. Uh, so, yeah, it was it it comes with its own unique level of stress. But also at the same time, it's hard to complain about because you're 
it's, it, you're super appreciative that it even is an opportunity that's come to you. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't know what I can describe it as the healthiest of stress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. It, 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 it comes from a good place, but yeah. it's also like, that's a, uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously you're not, it's like, it's like gaming adjacent, I feel like. And so mm-hmm. there, there's probably that, that thing of there's so much ownership of the creator and, and what's happening that if it goes the wrong way, it could get ugly really fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. And, and when you have a lot of people that put that much faith in you, you want to make sure you don't let them down. Exactly. Um, yeah. We, we really, really care about, uh, how we interface with our community and we have a very high standard for how we, uh, produce our stuff and we want to make sure that people are happy with what they've invested in. So we've taken a lot of care with the quality of people we brought on board um, and just wanting to make sure that we don't let people down. And uh, I, I can't say much right now, but uh, people are going to be, I think, really happy with how it's turning out. So I have to ask because uh, so you're one of the only people that I was like, let's let's ask uh, the audience in general, but also your audience. What are some some questions you want answered? Uh, and one of the things that kept popping up, right, were these positive notes about your character and you as a person. And then there was one that stuck out, stuck out to me. And I was like, is, what is this based around? Okay. Someone was like, Matt, he's such a gem. He needs to know that. I just wish that he would stop apologizing to the assholes of the internet. And I don't, oh, is there, is that in <laughs> reference to anything? Because I was like, what is that? Because there are people that can sometimes apologize too much, but I, I'm I'm unfamiliar. Fair enough, fair enough. No, I, I I think I get what they're talking about. I I'm I guess what you would call a very sensitive person. Sure. Not like not like in a defensive sensitivity necessarily, but in a like I'm to a to a, a not healthy degree sometimes an, a very empathic person, and I I spent most of my life trying desperately to please other people before I kind of pleased myself. I came out weird, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you can clip that. Clip I guess. it, yes. <laughs> uh, so you know, I've always been kind of lower in the priority chain. I'm trying to be better about that. I've been, you know, going to therapy specifically for things like that for the past kind of couple years. And uh, so, when I feel like I've harmed people or done something to to really deeply offend somebody when that was never the intent, I take it very hard, and. I'm getting to learn that sometimes more often than not, sometimes it's people coming with bad faith Mm. to you, especially through social media. When you have a platform, when you have a presence, when you, uh, you know, are a person with a, with a spotlight on you to a degree, it also attracts some people who have legitimate, you know, concerns or legitimate things they want to talk about. And that, and I am fully there for it, but there are people that, once again, are coming out from bad faith and are just wanting to punch at somebody, wanting to 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 either fulfill some sort of interest in bringing hurt because they hurt, or mm-hmm. they're trolling just for the fun of it, for the lulls. Who knows? But yeah, I've I've I know sometimes I've had the tendency to respond to those people when I really shouldn't, just to apologize and try and make things better. I've been over backwards for a random stranger on the internet mm-hmm. that's just enjoying the fact that they can get me to do that. So they're not wrong. They're not wrong. And uh, if you're watching, I'm working on it. <laughs> I feel it. I was like, don't you dare apologize for that either, that too. Um, I feel, I, I don't know if it's something that's that feels like it's changed over the past 10 years. Cause it used to be like, if someone was critical of me 10 years ago, I'd almost like jokingly agree with them and like take a shot at myself. And then there, there could be a day where it's like we end up and it's like, oh, it's kind of funny and we're buddies, right? Mm-hmm. Just me and this random stranger. That doesn't feel like the situation anymore. <laughs> that is like, I just want, I feel like what you're talking about of like the the bad faith thing, I and it's hard to talk about because people will general, generalize and say you're like throwing casting away all criticism. It's like, no, there's criticism mm-hmm. that's valid. But there are some people I think it's the, the anonymity and like the being able to shout at people that have the spotlight on them. It's like a way of exerting some sort of control some power mm-hmm. to be to make like to to push this thing that you see that's so much bigger your bigger than yourself and like be able to manipulate it uh that's that and so i i <laughs> i don't know if i've genuinely said sorry <laughs> for something <laughs> in years which i don't know is healthy i, I it's kind of like what you're saying i have to find that balance yeah the um, balance is key and I, I think you have you're you're totally on on the nose of that i i've had a, because i'm once again uh i poke the bear um, I've had a few individuals that came at me very hot online in the past, whether it be through 
anonymous emails, mm. very like, I still get those often, uh, as I'm sure you know that well. The, <laughs> um, but, but I'm also not a woman on the internet who gets the worst of it. My wife gets plenty worse than I do. Um, but uh, I've had, there have been some people that have said really terrible things on social media and such, and I've responded. Not in like an aggressive, fuck you kind of way, but like in a, you know, hey, well, I, if you feel this way, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, that's never the intent, you know, type of try, trying to engage people and show that, you know, maybe this is a better way to engage on social media, which it might, might be fruitless and honestly probably puts myself as things progress, not in a, a great place to be piled on, which happens sometimes right. too. But, but a lot, but a few of these times, these people who said these terrible things, when all of a sudden they get a response often go, I'm so sorry. I didn't think you'd see this. Oh, so you still, you still get people that are like, oh, okay, I don't get that anymore. Never, people just lean in. <laughs> oh, okay. I've, well, well, I, well, I also come in, you know, wanting to try and engage. And like I said, sometimes these people are like, I'm so sorry. I'm having a bad week. You know, my mom died recently and I'm just really angry and I have nowhere to put it. And I'm like, that is kind of what I was hoping and expected. And that's fine. Yeah. But for every one of those, there's 10, oh, this is a bad idea. I got to go. And so, yeah, to to the point we're discussing, Yeah, I need to maybe just step back a little bit. So let me just ask you then, uh, your your wife responded with that one, you know, uh, saying, give him the full Bar- Barbara Walters, uh, give him the full Barter, bleh, Barbara Walters treatment. Oh I said, okay, I'm going to be unnecessarily aggressive. Go. And then there was a person and I was like, I don't know if this is a person that is a friend or this is a person that he actually has an issue with. <laughs> Travis McElroy asked, ask him what it's like living in my shadow. <laughs> Fucking Travis. <laughs> I, I, there, I knew there was just one thing that I had to ask. <laughs> yeah, tra- tra- Travis is, is uh, a good, good man. I, I will say it's very cold. Um, <laughs> and and I, I will never live up to that magnificent facial hair as hard as I try, Travis. So thanks for bringing it up. At least you can grow some. I, uh, <laughs> on my Christmas break, uh, I mean, I, uh, I tried and nothing goes here. And it's just, it's, I, I could do a Fu Manchu, but then I'd get canceled. Oh, That's literally... Then don't go here. Just do like the full on, you know, Amish beard. You know, that's a great look. I can. So where it grows is here. Nothing here. <laughs> then here. Uh, so I've just <laughs> I've realized I just I'm going to try every Christmas and then just see if my hair is is decided that it's going to do it. So actually, Matt, I'm, I'm interested because I know that you, you know, you talked about how things were and then I know that you launched. But what was the what was the transition like going from, you know, this different environment to being. I imagine like a solely creator owned venture like what was what was it like for you doing that yeah it it, it was it was wild because when we started with geek and sundry uh it, we had n- no idea what this was and as it kind of grew and grew uh you know there were so many wonderful people that we had a chance to work with there both on like all across the twitch stream any of them are still friends and we uh you know well, we can't hang out right now necessarily, but digitally on Zoom, yeah. catch up and such. Um, and we're like extremely thankful for you know, the time that we had with the company. Um, but now we we have the opportunity uh, to create everything internally. Uh, we had our own studio that we ended up gathering and, and putting together, which was a, a whole another avenue of stress. Um, we realized very quickly when you have to handle it all yourself, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes mm-hmm. as talent that you just weren't aware of. And you're like, oh, we have to like hire people and we have to establish lighting grids and we have to rent a space that comes with all of that contract stuff. And then we have, oh, it's it, it was a whole lot of learning very quickly on our feet and draining all of our savings to try and make this happen because we believed in it and just keeping our fingers desperately crossed. Yeah, I mean, it seems very much like, because I've been on the the opposite end of it in the sense of like, I brought up the uh, the SourceFed crew and then, you know, that sold and then shut down and then they they kind of in in what you you guys did, they, they took control and had to deal with it. And there's all, and it's like, I always have like a mixed feeling with it. Like I, there's like a <laughs> dark side of my head that I'm like, now you see the struggles, motherfucker. But then there's also <laughs> the other part of me that's like proud because it's something that everyone can do. And I think 99 out of 100 creators should choose control 
over, I don't want to say sustainability, especially <laughs> because we may be living in several different kinds of bubbles right now. Mm -hmm. But I think control is the most important thing after doing it for 15 years. I mean, you're probably one of the only people I've had on the podcast that have been, has been in this and other industries for even longer than me. So I think you can probably, I mean, you probably feel right now like control. That is the key word. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. I, I, we're very appreciative that we have, we're in a position where we, we are, we are a fully creator owned business. Um, and it's been really wild and we're, we never expected it to go well. Whenever you go into business with your friends, it's a frightening thing because that story <laughs> You're braver never than ends me. well. You're braver than me, man. Dude, it is, it is the scariest thing, but I think it works because we began before even starting a business together, weirdly through the power of friendship and role-playing games, <laughs> we, we, we care so deeply about each other and trust each other that if there was a group to go into business with that were friends, this is one that we all felt comfortable would not fuck each other over. And also we all kind of naturally fit into different positions. You know, my wife uh, was creative director at Geek and Sundry for a while. Mm -hmm. And so she naturally transitioned into creative director for our channel. Um, Travis Willingham, one of our players, who's the, the big jock of our group, uh, turned out to be an amazing CEO and negotiator because he's a scary dude when he wants to be. <laughs> um, you know, we all just kind of fill into these positions and all went, I guess we'll try this. And here we are a few years later still working. And uh, I'm extremely thankful as much as it's been a nerve wracking journey to get here of like, wait, oh, shit, what do we do? Oh, hold this. Oh, God. You know. That kind of a thing. So for you, is this, uh, how long you want to do this? I, I, huh, to a degree, always. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the pace that we're going now, I, I will ignite in a number of years. <laughs> I will just be a, a pile of ash uh, in a pair of sweatpants. And that I, so for me, I will to a degree always be doing this. I love it too much. It's, but also, there eventually needs to be a torch to pass, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I I think I look forward to a day where we take our home game back privately. You know, the cameras are great and sharing it is great, but there also is something about kind of dovetailing it back into having it just us and maybe, uh, you know, still being involved in things, still doing, you know, small form shows in the channel, but also allow an opportunity for a new generation to come in and kind of carry it um, if well, we are lucky enough to have it go that long. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, when I looked through it and the, the more that I was looking into you, I was like, I wonder if as the years go on, he almost wants to uh, not to kind of lock you into a thing. But I was like, I wonder if he wants to like Bernie Burns the situation in the sense of like mm. build out this this world around him slowly become like less and less one of the key figures and but then like still get to help create the awesome because there is a, a part, I think, as a creator where you for lack of a better phrase, you kind of like get off on the idea of being able to bring up new talent and entertain people in a different way. Right. It, it kind of yeah. like, it scratches a different itch. Um, and I, when you said like kind of bringing it back, have you hit those moments? Cause obviously we all have ups and downs when, when you're doing something creative and your stuff involves so much imagination that I, I can mm -hmm. I imagine it like it burns you out even faster. Are there places where you've taken this hobby and this thing that you've loved, loved and, it does kind of di dilute the joy at certain times uh, out of what it, uh, what you used to get from it. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it it comes with the territory. Um, I, I it's a, more of a question of if the good outweighs the bad, which it currently does, thankfully. Um, like like a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you when you put something very personal on the internet, something that you thoroughly enjoy and that you're passionate about. Um, there will always be people that hate what you do and want, and to a certain degree, will put all their energy into try and tear it down. And for a person who is as emotionally available as myself, uh, that can be a very challenging experience. Um, you know, I, I call it pushing the bruise. Every, you know, creator can talk about stories about reading all the terrible comments and reading the thousands of wonderful positive ones, but the handful of really negative ones, are the ones that you remember, the ones you focus and obsess on. And I very much have had that problem through the years and I'm getting better about it. I'm, I'm learning to be better about it, but it's, it's hard when it's something that you are creating with your friends that you're just trying to bring joy with that you're trying to inspire people with. And you still see, misinterpretations 
uh, twisting of what you're doing and saying to fit a specific narrative that doesn't exist. And, and then those take fire in social media spaces. And then if you try and explain yourself, you know, or if you, if you were to ever try that, it would only help to add fuel to that fire. So you, you can, you don't defend yourself because you, you're almost in a position where you can't, you kind of just have to take it on the chin and keep pushing forward. And that's just tough. So that's the hard part about it. But seeing the overwhelming joy that comes through it, the people that connect with it, that do incredible art and write and create their own stories and play their own games and all the friendships and, and relationships and children that have come out of this community, people who met through it all and kind <laughs> yeah. of like seeing that to me is is really incredible. So so yeah, the the hard parts on certain days, especially in certain moments when they hit me hard, can really kind of knock the wind out of me for a protracted period of time. That's when I lean on my friends. That's when I lean on my wife. Yeah. Uh, but but the joy ha- heavily outweighs that aspect of it. And if that were to ever change, then we would have to make a change. You know, man, I'm going to be I'm, I'm going to be the the <laughs> the tough love stranger. If someone yeah. is going to watch a four hour piece of content to give you shit. <laughs> they have more problems in their life. I know I'm saying this without knowing any specific things, but if you are watching a four hour piece of content and you're ch- you're coming in to fucking hate and nitpick, you got you got to look in a fucking mirror. That's what you got to do. <laughs> like I get it on a like a 20 minute news video where I'm shouting like political opinions and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But you got to go out of your way. <laughs> like, I think I think that there's been this education over the past decade of like where people are trying to come from, people who used, who used to never have any voices. We've seen, yes, when cancel culture goes too far and then but then people not being held accountable like that's I understand like that's where it want, the, 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 we need a balance. But <laughs> it's insane. One of the most important things I think we need to learn from kind of like the pendulum swing of like the attacking people online and the not and and stuff like that is. We hopefully need to know the full situation, give people a little bit of grace. We're not always going to be perfect with that. I'm guilty of it sometimes of not doing it because uh, I'm at a certain place on the day. But we also have to give people a little benefit of the doubt and room to learn and grow and for a conversation. So I think if if someone, especially in what you're doing, like your whole thing, it seems like it's just about like creating this story. And obviously it involves the imagination. And so people... You know, it's also a little bit of a story that's happening in their head, but I don't know. I get, I'm like angry <laughs> on your behalf <laughs> because you seem like such a, a nice guy. And, and, but to the point of like, sometimes you, you stay quiet. That's the really fucking unfortunate thing is that we've been trained that it just gets worse. It just gets worse. You comment on one thing, then you have to comment on everything. And then because you're not commenting on stuff, oh, you're hiding something or you're scared. Yeah. And it's a lose, lose, lose situation. So, no. <laughs> uh, I want to say it was Hank Green uh, who, who had an analogy uh, about having a social media platform as like having this large suit of like robot armor on you. And so any small action you take, you don't realize how big the arm of this robot will sweep and do damage or have an impact. And so like even the tiniest things that we do on social media have a much larger reach than we expect. And sometimes just me making an offhand comment to somebody buried in responses can be misinterpreted and it turns into a whole thread within a day. But when I go back and check in and I'm like, whoa, what happened? Oh, that's not what I meant. And there's not much you can do about it. And mind you, that's, these are people like us. We are, we are white dudes. We are so privileged in comparison to so many more marginalized creators out there on mm-hmm. social media that get, so much more shit for people for smaller things. So it's it's just, it's a weird time. Social media has can do many good things and it can do many terrible things. Um, and I think we're still finding the balance as it continues to evolve and, and mutate. Um, I, I, I think it's a, it's a unique debate to be had over time as to whether or not the good outweighs the bad of social <laughs> media's impact on society at large. But uh, but yeah, it's just it's an odd space to try and navigate on a on a certain level. And um, I've been taking the healthy approach of of not engaging as much as I used to <laughs> because I have to. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I just wanted to take a second to thank one of the fantastic sponsors of today's episode of A Conversation With, 
Skillshare. You know, no matter what 2021 brings, you can spend it creating something meaningful with Skillshare's online classes. Skillshare is an online learning community with millions of members and thousands of classes. Take a class, connect with others. A premium membership gets you unlimited access to high quality classes on topics such as music production, photography, or even how to increase productivity. I know I've said it before, but my all time favorite on Skillshare has got to be Gary Vaynerchuk's Context is Key Social Media Strategy in a Noisy Online World. And if you want to check out that one, for example, it is just under 90 minutes of Gary sharing the same tactics and social media strategies that he's used over the years to grow huge brands like GE, PepsiCo, and even the New York Jets. And if that doesn't interest you, there's also a ton to learn from understanding and investing in crypto to art of ceramics, web design, graphic design, photography, and more. Skillshare really does have it all. And the best part, Skillshare is super affordable. Their annual subscription is less than $10 a month. So explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash DeFranco and get a free trial of a Skillshare premium membership. That is Skillshare.com slash DeFranco. So yeah, go check it out. Enjoy it. Love it. Uh, and back to the podcast. Hey, uh, so to change the subject from that, uh, mm -hmm. I, I I found out that we are uh, name changing buddies. So I wanted mm. to know why uh why did you change your last name? Because I have like because I've I've talked openly about like why I did yeah mine. yeah um partially when I decided to begin working as an actor, um one of the first things I did was look on IMDb and look at to see how many other Matt Millers there were. And there were a lot. It's a very common name. It's a and strong like, name. It is. Uh, and there's just, there's just a shit ton of Matt Miller. So I was like, ah, this is not going to work well when I joined the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, that eventuality back when I was like plotting this, uh, a, a lowly kid doing like, you know, non-union work I found on Craigslist. And that's mm -hmm. a whole different thing. But uh, when I finally joined the guild I, I decided to, to use the name mercer because it was a family name from generations back it's close enough to miller to where the ear will still pick it up if i hear it so it'd be an easier transition for me um and that was about it it all just happened very quickly and i was like that'll work fine sure and i never expected it to be like a name that people knew sure just something that would work from a professional standpoint of credits needed it and all these years later it's it's become so so much of my life that I occasionally have to remind myself that like, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, my, my real name is Miller. That's wild. And then I talk to my parents and they're like, hell yeah, go for it. <laughs> you, we don't care. We have no attachment to this, <laughs> this See, that's, lineage name. That's good for you, man. I, my dad stopped talking to me for half a year when I changed my name. Wow. He, he took it as the ultimate disrespect. And I was like, I was like, but I kept the junior cause I'm not forgetting you. And it was like a whole thing for a while. Oh, wow. And so I'm glad you had the support there. Cause, uh, what what's a wait what a what is what is your family like I'm I'm like Italian and then kind of Euro mutt what a what are you uh, a little bit of a, a Euro mutt um mostly kind of British Scottish okay with a little bit of German in there I think um, okay so I mean there there is a little bit of like with, with Scottish you have some machismo right you have like some of that like my family my family name. I'm, and I'm sure we did before my dad, um, <laughs> to an extent. My my dad, I'm so thankful, is I, I'm very much like him in a lot of ways. He's he's the sensitive musician kid, the the, the youngest of six kids in out of uh, Florida and Georgia area, um, and he was you know very much the the long haired hippie kid of a dad who worked for the electric company, and you know <laughs> there was. So if you rebelled, you would have been like an accountant. <laughs> yeah, right. Could have possibly been. Yeah, my, my my dad specifically raised me by not doing as his father did. His father, my grandfather on his side was not a not a good man in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and even in hindsight, we've had a lot of conversations about it. And I actually wrote a song about him after he passed, kind of like a song of, of forgiveness and remembering the good things about him and everything. And And we spoke a lot about it kind of the importance of learning from the mistakes of those before you and things like that. Uh, but yeah, so my, I, I definitely that the, any sort of, of tie to bloodline and name lineage definitely died before it got to my father. So. No, that's <laughs> what you said about the song, I think is important. Like the, the more that I, I live, the more that I realize like forgiveness is a gift that we give ourselves, right? Not really mm -hmm. so much for the other person, especially <laughs> posthumously but oh, yeah. uh yeah i uh wait so okay so your dad was kind of like a, a hippie-ish dude what was uh what was your mom like or is she, like i'm sorry uh, yeah no worries no there uh she's was also kind of a hippie-ish girl um she was a little bit into theater and creative writing 
um, but got into theater production. My grandmother, weird kind of story tangent. My my grandmother for for a while was the like main like executive assistant producer for Burt Reynolds and a lot of his productions mm-hmm. in Florida. Um, so she worked on a number of his films uh, and was kind of the only member of the family that went into show business at that time. Everyone else was. You know, local schools in South Carolina and, you know, the, those regions of Florida. Uh, but through that, my mom got in when she was young into theater. And then she began to help with the Burt Reynolds Dinner Theater in Florida, which was kind of this little dinner theater that he owned for a while. My dad ended up doing sound mixing on the soundboard for that theater when they started dating. And uh, then they all, my mom got a job at... MTM Studios to write for Evening Shade, Burt Reynolds' show that my grandma was executive producing. And we moved from Florida to California when I was nine so she could pursue that. Um, show didn't last that long. And then after that, it became kind of a creative scramble of both my parents trying to make a living in mm-hmm. the tumultuous industry that is entertainment. And so when you were when you were younger, like you were in middle school, high school, what did you what did you want to be? Middle school? Uh, Middle school is like, maybe you want to be a firefighter or something. <laughs> right. No, yeah. I, mean, I was very young. I knew I wanted to be a chemist because I love the idea oh, yeah. of like chemical reactions and um, just messing with matter. When I was in middle school, I wanted to be an, up through high school, actually, I wanted to be an, an illustrator or an animator. I, I loved art and I had, loved, I was always the kind of the quiet kid that did his work and drew monsters and creatures and stuff in his sketch pad and uh, I made a decent amount of money in middle school drawing naked pictures of comic book characters for kids. At the request. <laughs> that hustle. It, hey. That it, art it, kid it, hustle. I love it. It paid well, man. Uh, and and none of us knew what the anatomy really looked like, so they couldn't judge my lack of understanding. Hey, man, that was that was a perfect time for the market because what? you would have That would have been the 90s? Yeah. No, yeah, was, he was, was just, killing it. AOL hadn't quite hit yet, so <laughs> it, the only source they had for for boobies and penis was uh, yeah. whatever I could concoct, and and they had to go, they had to deal with it. You had the you had the market. You were like you were like yo. I mean, I don't want to say <laughs> I don't want to say middle school hustler, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I, I get what you mean. Yeah, I get what you mean. <laughs> but okay, so and okay, so you have those those aspirations, uh, and then it's time for for college. Do you go to college? What do your parents want you to do? What what's happening there? I I was planning to go to college, uh, Cal Arts for animation, like two D and three D animation. Um, but through the high school experience, I began to question that path a little bit. I began to talk with a bunch of people in animation and who loved it and loved their jobs, but the the discipline, the level of skill, and a lot of the things about it began to kind of not resonate with me as much. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't have a lot of money, and I didn't want to throw myself into a bunch of debt for something I wasn't certain of. So I decided to take a break from going into school before I really figured myself out. So instead I went into the workforce, um, which involved a number of unique jobs doing like temp agency work, stocking shelves and warehouses, doing data entry for environmental impact studies, all sorts of weird things. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of game testing, actually. I, I built a career in game development on the, the quality assurance side for many years, worked up through the ranks there, and began producing some video games, uh, like associate producing and producing. Started in edutainment, which is, you know, like Land Before Time, Great Valley Racing Adventure, and Berenstain Bears Extreme Sports on the Game Boy Color. Yes, that was an actual game wow. that I spent three months playing and wanted to kill myself. <laughs> oh, no. So, I love, uh, I love yeah. the the weirdness that of games that we used to get in that kind of area, like games <laughs> that had no right being made. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were just cheap enough to produce at the time that yeah. they could just throw a ridiculous license on a pre-existing structure and be like, release it, it's fine. The closest thing to, I would say to that that I've seen is, and it's like still it's usable, is like uh, that, what was it, uh, Race with Ryan, like uh, that Ryan mm-hmm. YouTuber. Uh, yeah. Our house is just like decorated and systems that have games on it. And I'm just like, it's such a, this is the closest thing to it, but it's still, it's still like even the weird games now are almost, are like infinitely better. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, the games are, the industry still needs to catch up a little bit. In what way? Uh, uh, in, in, in the way that the development cycle for games, especially when it comes to AAA games is still very 
crunch culture. Um, it's very harsh on the teams. I, and I got to see it from internally from our, you know, I, I worked 80 plus hour weeks on the QA side uh, on games that needed to come out. Mm -hmm. um, and when you do that week after week after week after week after week, especially if you're managing a team, it becomes a very traumatic experience um, because not only are you emotionally falling apart and and you can see the work that you're doing, the quality of it decline because it's what happens. But the people that rely on you as a leader are also undergoing the same thing. That guilt even compounds onto you. And so seeing that happen, that crunch culture is just a really, a really frustrating thing that I hope we begin to work away from going forward now that more people are talking out about it. Now that there's you know discussions on game development side of things about possibly unionizing mm -hmm. um, and, and really just coming to trust in the fact that at a certain point, the, the gains you get diminish to not be worth it. You know, if, if you instead just plan properly a, a, a budget and a time schedule mm -hmm. for a games development cycle and trust the fact that, people can rest and do more quality work in a shorter period of time as opposed to just dragging them out, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get to a place where it doesn't become this, this grinder that the game development, the game game development industry is and has been for yeah. a while. Well, so because the, the Naughty Dog situation is a little further away, then I, I'd be interested in what are your thoughts with what happened with CD Projekt Red over the past few months and obviously most recently with uh, the hack. Mm -hmm. But what are your what are your thoughts there? Because I know there was for me, it's like very loud and then very quiet because I don't live in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's like it has to be almost bubbling into the to the mainstream for me to see it. But like I know that there was a lot of criticism regarding the timeline there, uh, the the crunch culture, especially considering like the delays and things like that. Like, is that just an example of what you're you're talking about? Very much so. Very much so. And it's it. it always seems to come down to an issue with management because the yeah. people on the ground floor, the hundreds of people that are busting their ass to make these games that are sweet, talented people that are here because they're passionate about making these games and want players to enjoy them um, are often given impossible situations and are told, make it happen or else. And that, that comes from some, you know, top end management decree and it very much is a shit rolls downhill type circumstance. So, mm -hmm. Um, and it has this culture now where if, when people begin to talk out about their experiences and, and raise their concerns, not always, but in some places, the response is, well, if you don't like this job, we have a, bu a whole bunch of kids that are coming out of full sale that we can go ahead and hire to replace you. I mean, that's that way in practically every industry, but it's definitely prevalent in the video game industry. And so I'm, I'm hoping it gets better. And I, th I think part of that comes from helping empower people on the lower end, or at least the, the more broad scope of the industry versus those who are in the higher positions of management or the publishers. Um, I think things like what's happening with CD Projekt Red and, you know, Cyberpunk are the perfect examples to try and help change that culture. It's unfortunate things have to break before things can get better, but that's the nature of it, you know, in order for, for people to really have prime examples of what can go wrong if you continue to enforce this type of culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have faith. I'm also an internal optimist to a a, 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 fail, a fault. Admittedly. Well, I, I was I was wondering like how like when you're talking about unionization and like can cultures change? I wonder how the change of the pandemic and a lot of like remote working how that strengthens or weakens the the, the possibility. Um, because I mean. I, there, I know there have been there's been a little talk of like there could be game droughts and so like a hyper focus on what can and can't be done and the hours that have to be put in. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I, I haven't had too many deep conversations about the the larger impact of the pandemic on game development beyond uh, hiring being easier. Really? Because well, previously, big, one of the biggest hurdles for being hired in game development was relocation, having to relocate to wherever the studio was. Right. Um, and oftentimes that was a very difficult decision to make because of people who are looking for a job for a long time as a, you know, a 3D rigger, as a texture artist, uh, you know, uh, have to take that opportunity that moves them and their family across the country or to another country. And they have to uplift their whole life to go there and hope they can find a place to live that mm -hmm. suits their lifestyle. Uh, that is largely becoming not an issue as this pandemic is proving. That's a positive, but conversely, could we see that be an easier way to challenge people that 
they can be easily replaced in that same argument. Mm-hmm. I guess we'll have to we'll have to see. Talent is talent, no matter where it is, and I I think I think it it is an improvement that people will be able to accept positions without having to completely uproot their life. I think that's going to be helpful in all industries, really, to a certain extent, but uh, game industry, definitely. So when are we going to, when are we going to see, because if you have comic books and uh, the board games and and all that stuff, when are we going to see a critical role video game? Oh man. Oh, hopefully some point soon. That'd be awesome. (laughs) That that would be a, 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 a unique kind of, chapter book yeah, it feels, end in my life it feels like it feels like uh like when uh what was it penny arcade made their games you know what i mean yeah. it feels like the you have the audience that would be perfect for it <laughs> like uh, your conversion rate would be probably like 50 percent, which is amazing <laughs> Well, fingers crossed. And and hey, if there's any any publishers out there that are, you know, good to their developers, please go ahead and, and let us know. <laughs> there were a bunch of develop- there were, there were a bunch of people going, oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the challenge of it all. Um, so how uh, I'm trying to think, how then do you get into because you're talking about doing these odd jobs and 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 the kind of the that flow. How do you get into the hobby of D&D or was that always kind of a thing? Uh, when you were younger? Uh, I I had heard about it when I was very young, but never really interfaced with it uh, until high school directly, like my freshman year of high school. Um, I had um, I had the Monster Manual when I was younger because my mom found it at a garage sale and was like, oh, this is right up Matt's alley. It's just filled with beasts and mythological monsters. And, I was, and it was great. And I went through and read all the stuff about the, the lore. Didn't really know what the numbers did, but I just loved the content of it. And... When I was in high school, my freshman year, I was super much the, the the quiet artist kid, and I got involved in what was called the Popular Arts Club, which was the one club that I was drawn to because it was the it was the anime video game club. It was it was everything that I loved in one club. That was the Popular Arts. Was the way of saying it that other kids were like, "Oh wow, that's legitimate," and we're like, "Yeah, sure, we're just <laughs> playing Street Fighter at lunch. It's fine." Yeah. Um, but the the people who ran the club were all seniors. They were all, you know, these awesome, like, track runner nerds who I was like, wow, they're so cool. And they were like, hey, artist kid, thanks for drawing our logo for our, our club. Do you want to play in our D&D game? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Whatever, whatever you want. Yeah, okay. So I made my first character um, and joined the game. And I immediately could see kind of the potential of it. And I had fun. But it wasn't my vibe. They were less into the story. They were more into the mechanics and just killing monsters, take the gold. They very much played it the equivalent of how we all played, you know, Diablo the following year. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I just I saw I saw there was more potential there to tell a story, which is what I I really wanted to connect with. So I ended up starting my own game. Just kind of picked up the mantle to start dungeon mastering and invited one of my friends from that game that I knew for a while and a couple other friends and started figuring it out by just barreling through a Kool-Aid man style, just like, oh yeah, I don't know what I'm doing and fell in love with it. And it became this, this ritual every week or two where we'd get together and play for an afternoon. And it just, it, my, my imagination exploded and it became my favorite pastime. And then I met a teacher in Mr. Busby at my high school who had, it was his first year teaching. He saw me reading the book after class one day and he started talking to me about how he loves playing role-playing games. And he lent me his Shadowrun RPG book and got me into the Amber book series and the Amber Diceless role-playing game. I didn't realize there was more beyond D&D much at this point. Right. And so it just kind of opened up the world there for me. And I, I loved it. I loved it. But it was still a thing you didn't really talk about openly. Mm-hmm. You know, Is there it, was a stigma. Yeah, well, <laughs> there was, I feel like the yeah, other, especially then, and it's probably not, it just changed like what is a stigma. Uh, but mm-hmm. yeah, like I, uh, I was playing with, uh, my friends, like with Pokemon cards and, and magic cards. And there were like tears of, <laughs> of card <laughs> nerds. Uh, and, but I never, I, there was never anyone around my school that, that I knew, uh, played D and D the, the, the only thing that I would do, cause I, at that time of like middle school, uh, I, I lived in Asheville, North Carolina. And mm-hmm. the closest thing to that is on my dial up, I found these. They, I forget if they were like auto refreshing forums, but essentially these like RP forums. Oh, and, yeah. And yeah. And so like it was like <laughs> a forum uh, would be like, this is the tavern and then this is like the town. And then this is the and it, once they made it so like your name could have like health points next to it. I was like, this is the this is the fucking top tier of <laughs> role playing. 
bad. This is like, how does anything get better than this? And then I feel like I feel like I missed the bus back then because that was the closest thing. And like I mm-hmm. I never talked to anyone about it. I was like, no one cares. <laughs> no one's gonna understand this. I'm already like n- non-existent or like a loser in a lot of people's minds. But it was uh it's interesting hearing you hearing you talk about it. So for you. Did you just kind of naturally gravitate towards this kind of dungeon master role or uh, how does how does that happen? I mean, do you ever get to just be a person playing the game anymore? Every now and then. Yeah, uh, it's it's a rare occurrence. OK, um, these days just because of time. Um, but and you're a control freak now. <laughs> <laughs> Weird, weirdly, no, uh, yeah. d- to that degree. But it's it's just it's a position I love. And for a long time the person who runs the game, the dungeon master, game master, whatever the system is, is it's a lot of effort comparison to being a player where you just show up and play for the most part. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't want to take up that mantle. So often you fall into the role because no one else is willing, but you all want to play. And so you're like, well, all right, I'll do it. And so that's kind of how it starts. And then you realize, yes, it is a lot of effort and it's a lot of energy to prep and, you know, try and, and be at your best when you come to the table but it's so fun. It's there's yeah. nothing quite like it in my opinion. It's it's this beautiful gift. If you have a right if you have a good group of people and you all have a good rapport and you you trust each other, you can really create some magic at that table. Uh and it, and it feels like magic because it's it's all improvised. It's all based on what you're coming up with and reacting to each other and the world with and the dice. Uh for those who haven't played the games, you roll them to basically uh, set success and failure for moments of challenge or difficulty. You're trying to mm-hmm. convince somebody of a lie you're telling, so they'll let you through into a private, you know, club. Uh, you roll to see if you succeed or fail, you know, and then based on that success or failure, the story takes different choices and different avenues, and so it's this thrill of not knowing what's going to happen next. Um, and and as a dungeon master, being able to to build that space and gift that to your friends, be like, I made this for you. Now play with it, break it and make it ridiculous. And then they do. And it's, it's just, it's a very, I don't know. It's a very fulfilling experience for me. Can, can campaigns end in failure? Does that, is that something that happens or is it always kind of like fairy tale ending? No, they certainly can. Yeah. Um, it, it depends on the type of players you're with. Mm-hmm. Cause the thing to keep in mind is you're, you're all there to have fun. And if, it ending an absolute failure and that's the end of the story is not fun for people at the table, then maybe you want to find a way to to at least continue the narrative. I had a game where uh, where the majority of my players made terrible mistakes and ended up being torn apart by ghouls and only two of them survived. Um, one of them screaming, no, it was the other one grabbed her and like, you know, forced them both to run and flee. And the next few sessions were so somber as they were kind of just realizing they lost these friends they've been playing with for two years at this point. Um, and I kind of checked in and was like, are you guys, do you guys want to continue their story or do you want to try something new? And they went, I mean, I still want to continue their story or at least the possibility of it. Okay. Let me think on that. So I had them create new characters, developed a narrative where they hired these new adventurers to basically do a recovery run so they can give them a proper burial, Mm -hmm. went back got vengeance on these ghouls, recovered the bodies, and through a, a communion with like the god of death in this world, gave them the option of if you want to continue the new character that you made, you can, or you could make a sacrifice of some kind to bring back the character that died. And two of them went, no, I'm going to stick with the new characters. And one of them said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing this character who is his... I'm sorry, I'm getting super lore nerd here. The, <laughs> the, the character, the, the new character he created was the long lost sister of his original character that he'd been searching for the entire campaign. Mm. And for this moment, he, the sister sacrificed herself to bring his original character back, her brother. And so in a really like bittersweet twist, he did come back to life, got to continue his story. But the sister he'd been searching for this whole time ended up dying to save him. And it was this very like emotional broken moment and it was wonderful and dark, but we were all there for that type of drama. And here I am like eight years, nine years after it happened, still telling it like it was a few weeks ago. So would you, I mean, so yeah. So, I mean, would you classify what you do as improv? Like just, I mean, it's not improv comedy, but I mean, there's very funny moments uh, and stuff like that, but it sounds very much like it's just a different form of improv. A lot of it is. Um, yeah. For for the players, it is largely improv with structure. 
You know, you have mm-hmm. a character with attributes and things that that kind of guide what you're good at, what you're bad at, and you kind of lean into that as part of your character interactions and such. For the for the the person who runs the game, the dungeon master or game master, it's um <clears throat> a little more structured. It's you know improv with the structure because you have to. We well, don't have to. You can improvise it entirely. And I've done sessions where like I didn't have time to prep, or people decided they wanted to play on the spot. I'm like, all right, we're just going to see where it goes, and you improvise the whole thing, and that's also really fun. But it also gets really weird very quickly. Um, I like. Uh, because because I, I care enough to have a, enough structure to feel comfortable when I come to the table. I do a little bit of prep, world building, you know, flesh out some NPCs they might encounter. Right. But also at a certain point, you have to let go and expect that the story might not go anywhere you expect it to go. And you just kind of ride the wave, creating characters on the fly and figuring out what they do and what they sound like and what they want and what they're scared of. And and it is at that point pretty much purely improv. And it's yeah. Well, wild. yeah, and I'm, I'm even thinking of it more as not just like obviously you have to come off of things the top off the top of your head, but you've done these in front of an audience, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've and done so, some live shows too. So I would say, well, what are the what are the key differences, best things or pitfalls uh, when you think of like how you're having to do it now, um, or like if you know uh, how you're doing it there versus if you're doing it in front of uh, a crowd that's in person. Um, I would say when you're doing it in front of a crowd, there's a lot of energy. Um, which can, which can be a very exciting and thrilling thing. It also means that you're just kind of hyped up and the nerves definitely crank up a lot more. (laughs) We've done some live shows with, with some incredible audiences. I think we we did a live show before the pandemic ended where we had close to 2000 people in the audience and hearing that volume of people shouting and cheering is extremely invigorating and and also one of the most like like crystalline existential crisis i've ever had of like what am i doing why am i here i'm bullshitting with my friends and dice on a stage and these people paid to be here and i hope i'm not letting them down oh god but that's what i mean it sounds like you're like <laughs> you wwe wrestlers but you don't know how it's gonna end <laughs> Like, yeah, I love don't. that idea. It's it's really wild. And, and that's part of the thrill too. And we've and, and there's always a fear with every live show that we've done in front of an audience of like, man, I hope this isn't a dud. Cause some because some <laughs> episodes, some sessions are, sure. are are a little more low-key. Sometimes that get meanders a bit in the story as the players are figuring out what they want to do. Sometimes it's a shopping episode where they're just wanting to buy magical items and potions and shit. And like hopefully we don't do that for this live show. But um so far we've we've been pretty good. But that that's a big difference to the live show between doing it in our more private kind of studio setting where it's just us at the table. It feels much more intimate. Um, but also it's fun to occasionally invite people into that space and, and, and do that. And, uh, they're, they both have their benefits, I'd say. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I just want to take a second to thank one of the sponsors of today's episode of a conversation with Lucy. You know, Lucy was researched and developed for three years by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better, cleaner nicotine alternative made for people, not patients. To steer you away from cigarettes, vaping, dip, or other harmful, less appealing substances, Lucy developed a gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate. And for those ready to kick the habit, Lucy's nicotine lozenges can help with that. And it's a bonus that they come in a delicious cherry ice flavor. And the best part about Lucy is that it's super convenient on flights, at work, in the gym, or wherever. Lucy's products are portable and discreet. You know, honestly, and actually, especially as someone that grew up in a house of smokers, it, it makes me happy to see that there are all these options that people can have now. Right? Make it easy, and, and right, and that's the best part. Lucy comes directly to your door each month, so you don't even have to think about it. So what are you waiting for? Get rid of those cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw out the dip, get your hands on some Lucy products today. And right now, Lucy is offering you beautiful bastards 20% off all products on your first order. Just go to lucy.co and use promo code Phil. That's lucy.co, and be sure to use promo code Phil at check. Out. And of course, in full disclosure, warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco, which is an addictive chemical. And with that said, back to the podcast. And on, on like the note of bring people in, because I know that you've you've uh, you've uh, DM'd for like Vin Diesel and uh, a few a few celebrities are to my knowledge. What's like who's the singular standout if, I, if, if you can give me one like, wow, that was crazy. Oh, man. Stephen Colbert. Yeah. Yeah. Bar none. I've I've been such a fan of his for so long, like since the Strangers with Candy era on Comedy mm-hmm. Central. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've just been such a fan of him as a comedian and as the years go on, just as a person. 
um, and, a, and a person who has been overtly nerdy with a platform, you know, as a kid right. who grew up on Lord of the Rings and, and loving a lot of these classically nerdy things, having him unabashedly be like, no, no, I will, I will throw down with you about, you know, the, the, the Iru. I, I, I will go ahead and, 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 you know, combat you on your knowledge of the first, second and third age of Middle Earth. I'm like, fuck yes. Um, so for years I joked when people would ask at panels, like if you could run a game for anybody, who would it be? And I'm like, Stephen Colbert, bar none. He's my top rung. And the opportunity came uh, a couple years ago. We began working with Red Nose Day to mm -hmm. do some charity initiatives to run a game for him. And that was one of the most nerve wracking lead ups of my entire life. You want to talk about don't fuck this up, like internal voice monologue yeah. on repeat. Oh, man, that, that was and it happened real fast. It was like, hey, in two weeks, do you want to do this? Fly out to New York and run a game one on one. Not even with a group one on one with Stephen Colbert. And I'm like, sure. Oh, no. Oh, God. Um, but he was so cordial and so genuine and excited to be there. And you can see he was like, cool, I'm going to show up and play d, &D. I haven't played since college, whatever. This yeah. will be a fun thing. And then within a few moments of getting into it and describing the world around him and the beginning of the narrative and kind of drawing him into the story, watching him go from like Stephen Colbert to this like excited teenager was it will be one of the greatest moments of my life I, it was <laughs> it was so wonderful he came in and engaged with me wholeheartedly mm -hmm. he was invested he was reacting with excitement at reveals and successes and getting intensely frustrated and worried with failure and and we only had an hour because he's a busy man but in that hour like uh they say don't meet your heroes but every now and then one really comes through and and it, it, completely surpasses your expectations um, and he I'm did so that. glad to hear that because <laughs> yeah I, I would mainly be yeah whenever it, with a Colbert I'd be worried like oh please actually be who I think you are and then two please I don't want to say anything that's going to make me feel like he thinks I'm stupid <laughs> totally same same oh my god he uh, walked into the room with one of the original Lord of the Rings troll figures the big like rubber did. skin troll figure that like throws the, the mace down and he walks into the room who wants to save the world? And I was like, all right, we're in. Let's do this. <laughs> That's great. So actually kind of on the notes of like highs and lows, because obviously you have, I was saying before we even started filming, you have such a, a, a catalog of, of what you've done voiceover work for. What's been the, the, the job that you were most excited to get? Uh, and then what's the weirdest voice <laughs> that you've ever done? <laughs> it, uh, interesting. Um, Man, I would say uh, initially, initially the the first real like big job that kind of elevated my career uh, and in an odd way led, led to critical role uh, was being cast in Resident Evil 6 as Leon Kennedy. Mm -hmm. I love the Resident Evil franchise, played them all growing up and you know, through high school and there on. And Leon Kennedy was a favorite character of mine. Uh, so to, to then step into the role for six and was huge for me and definitely another one of those don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up, don't fuck it up moments. Um, and while the game was received mixed to a degree, uh, I had a blast working on it and was very proud of that. So that that was the first huge like, oh, my God, this, yeah. is, this is incredible for me. Since then, there have been a number of projects that I was really proud to be part of. But the one that continues to really make me happy is Overwatch because of the reach of it mm -hmm. because of the kind of uh you know the the positive energy that it brings to people who have engaged with the overwatch uh you know characters and in, in that world for a while and it's a character that you know even with the silly catchphrase is fun though i i get quite i get asked way too often what time it is it's still <laughs> and it's, it's fun it's fun to act annoyed by it but i'm still very thankful to have that and yeah. through I remember seeing the first trailer for it, a reveal at BlizzCon, and I was like, this game is incredible. It looks like a Pixar CG. Like, I want to, I would kill to be part of this. And then when the audition came through from McCree, I was like, oh, I recognize this character art. Uh, uh. Uh, so I, it became a really intense, like, manifestation moment of like, please, 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 please. And then when it happened, I was so, so excited. And then the benefit of that was not only getting to work with the team, but to meet all the other actors that worked on it. It, and and the, the Overwatch voiceover cast, it it is like a, the closest I've had to a family mm. on one project. It feels like the old days of being in theater and you've been working on a theatrical production for months together and you become a family for that short time. But this is now we're going five years on 
And every person, every new character that's announced and the new cast member that's brought forward, we all just be like, we're all like, welcome. Yay. We're so happy. New people to the family. And we all still talk to each other and text and email. And, you know, uh, I, I, I miss the fact that we can't see each other at conventions in recent times, but, um, extremely excited that I got to be part of Overwatch and now with Overwatch 2 coming up more more fun to be had <laughs> and then what's what would you say is like the the weirdest voice you've done and it could be like early in your career no, no, yeah that's right the weirdest voice uh <laughs> there there have been some interesting ones uh they tend to okay there are there are video games that you do because you're excited about it and you're like this is art there are video games that you do they are a paycheck <laughs> um, yes this this is this is to make rent uh and uh, there are some very unique games that come over from japan that need english localization uh there is a game called akiba strip i think it's called where okay. it takes place in japan and the world is beset by secret vampires and you defeat them by beating them up and their clothes fall off and then the sun burns them away so it's so you you beat people into nudity to kill them Japan. Uh, <laughs> and as part of this, my friend Talison was actually directing it and he had me in to just do some subtle voices and they had these different voice prints uh, for the game and one of them was Foreigner. And in the Japanese version, the Foreigner was just an American voice. Sure. And so for the English version, like, can I make a Foreigner? And Talison went, whatever dialect you want to. And I was like, oh, why not? We'll do Scottish. So I went ahead and decided <laughs> to go ahead and do a, a deep brogue for this one. Um, which was, was, wasn't was too weird in its own right. But then as we were recording, we discovered as part of the game, they could customize NPC voices in the game to be any of these voice matches. So they could set the super cute, like, anime maid girl to have this deep Scottish brogue when you came into a cafe. <laughs> Hello, dear, would you like some tea? Um, so that, that made for, for an interesting quirk. Um other weird one would probably be I worked on a Mad Max video game that came out a few years ago. Um, where I did a bunch of like the the general scrappy war boys and there's a lot of sessions of screaming and yelling and stuff. But there was about 30 minutes of that session where they had to do f- probably 25, 30 different cues of various vomit sounds. <laughs> And I was like, you, you're not cool with just like one or two. They're like, well, no, we need one if he's being punched. We need one if he's just dry heaving. We need one if he's, oh, wow. you know, extremely ill. We need one as if it's a reactive one. I'm like, I'm really curious as to what engine you're, you know, what new type of gameplay engine you're experiencing in this. And and it turned into a session of, and for each one you do three takes. So it was a lot of just pretend vomiting after pretend vomiting. And they're like, no, bigger. We need it stronger. And at a certain point, your body starts going, oh, oh, we're doing this. Yeah. So that was that was a that was a rough session. Definitely had to keep a little uh, a little bin nearby just in case. Like, can we get one's a little wetter? Can you drink some water first? I'm like, oh my god, that was unique. I love that, Matt. Before <laughs> we uh, jump into uh, some questions from from your fans, because uh, I know that you're someone that that watches the show. Uh, do you have any questions for me before I make it all about you again? Yeah, no, actually, this is awesome. Uh, first off, yes, me and my wife have been watching your show for quite a while. She actually, when we first started dating, I think was hired on one of your episodes, Marisha, as like a sexy ninja girl. Uh, it's like 10 years ago. No uh, way. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> I remember this because I was like going on vacation and really? Yeah. Yeah. Back, that, that was... Where we were all hustling on the net then. <laughs> oh my god! I got, I got, I got to go back. I, I, I think we still have all the old videos somewhere. That's, that's fucking crazy. I didn't connect yeah. that. Yeah. So, but so, but we we when you began to really kind of dive into this format, we were like, oh, that's really cool. And yeah, you know, not to not to make this like weird fanboy moment, but you you have since then been kind of a large part of our daily kind of news check in. Not uh, weird at all. YouTube. Thank you. <laughs> so thank, thank, thank you for, for doing that. I mean, we have many news sources. It's important to have many sources from mm-hmm. all standpoints, just so you have that perspective. But uh, it's always nice to be like in the middle of the day, sit down and be like, oh, cool. New Phil. All right, cool. <laughs> um, and, and, and you had uh, my friend uh, Daniel on a couple times in this podcast. And uh, that kind of really kind of that, – that's when we realized there was a conversation where it was like, oh, shit. Oh, go watch yeah, yeah, yeah. Slosko talk to, to Phil for a while. So uh, we're fans. My question to you, I would say, is how odd and 
challenging has it been to transition with a family in the spotlight? Ooh. You know, I will say, I'd like to say, oh, it didn't really change anything. Um, one, it changed my priorities regarding what I do with my time. Um, mm-hmm. I used to go in at like four o'clock in the morning, um, having a family and also understanding I, I was going to burn out. Uh, I built up a team and uh, we finally got the team to a place that I'm very happy with. Uh, and so I can still, and we find like, we. I feel like this year, actually, in the past two months, I've been proud of the show again. Um because near the end of last year, I think like a lot of people, I was really worn down and I was like, oh. like I was thinking today, I was like, why do I feel like lighter? Like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm walking with less weight on me. And I was like, oh, cause I don't feel like everything's going to fucking explode right now. Like yeah. at least like the explosion's a little further away. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I just don't feel it, imminent doom. And so, but so, so you know, you you surround yourself with with people that you think are uh, make other things manageable or better uh, at certain things. Like we have people that essentially have each week. Everyone has like a beat, and so that's been good there. But it's made me more empathetic. It's made me understand. But that's also part of just doing this for so long. Because when I was younger and I did my show, I went out for blood sometimes mm-hmm. like um and there are some things that i'm like ah oh, i wish i had had like where, where i had the brain that i have now then other times if it's like a daddy oh five situation i'm like nope that was valid uh i did what what was right to do there um i'm yep. really really glad that we researched heavily and worked with uh, there was a really a whole community effort there um of research um but it's made me also <laughs> worried about or more aware of the fact that people are i'm dealing with on a day-to-day basis are googling me um Mm. because you have a lot of other parents out here and uh, (laughs) because because you know your kid goes to school and people googling like crazy sometimes just because they just want to see like what you do and other times i don't know it can be for weird reasons uh Mm -hmm. and so uh and I mean, we're we're guilty of it. I remember when we went uh, to a smaller degree, we went to a, a place where that we were eyeing for a school, and we were like, "Everyone here is famous." <laughs> I was like, "What is?" I was like, "This is so weird." I feel like because also I'm like I feel like I've talked about half these people, and I'm like, "Oh my god, that's so fucking strange." Um, and so it makes me more aware of uh, that my words don't just kind of end from me to person B, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's always been the case, but it's made me hyper aware. So I think that's it. Just priorities. Um, and also I'm like 35 now. So I've been in the mindset of what am I going to do in for five years from now? Right. Yeah. Like how, how can I set up my life so that if I only do a version of this for five more years, cause I'm very much like you, I, I want to do a version of this for a long time. Like I love it. I, the reason I still do it isn't the the paycheck that's nice but it's because i feel like i feel connected to the audience and it makes me feel actually like more connected and less lost in the chaos the the world provides us every day Hmm. but yeah i would say that whenever i answer your questions about myself i ramble but yeah that's no that's me i'm 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 happy to hear that i'm I'm glad you're i'm glad you've built a team to help balance a little better that's that's the hard part when when you're a creator, especially a creator that is in charge of the ownership and development of your own company and it continues to grow, um, it's, and I've, I'm a fault of it a lot, is when you know how you want things to be, it's difficult to delineate responsibility. Mm. Because sometimes in previous experiences, people have let you down or disappointed you and, and you have an instinct to be like, I'll just do it myself because I know how I want it and I, and I, I can know I can at least push myself to get to that point. Um, and I've done that for many years, but at a certain point you have to find the right people that you can trust that can, can help support the things you want to do and then bring their own ideas to the table and even further elevate what you're doing. And that's been part of our weird transition too, is as critical Role has grown from just the eight of us to this, this actual company now with wonderful people. Um, it just makes me happy to, to see creators in the space that acknowledge at a point of near burnout that I need to restructure and find a way to make this work healthily. So good on you. 
What uh? Well, so wait. Do you have a uh, what's yeah? What, what's your life situation? Do you have uh, kids? What do you have brothers sisters? What's what's that? No kids, but we do have uh, a bird, Dagon, yeah. and a a corgi named Omar that we got back in May. Nice. Who is amazing? Um, I have one brother. who's a younger brother uh, by two years, but he is seven inches taller than me. It was unfair. I was the prototype. He was the <laughs> final release version. Um. And my wife, Marcia, has a younger sister of, I think, 13 years or 10. So when, 10. when you're saying like you're trying to figure out work-life balance, are you talking about work-life balance for this or work-life balance for... <laughs> I always feel weird talking about this because it's like, mm -hmm. but like, uh, like, because you want to grow a family out or what? What's, uh, what are you thinking? Uh, for, for primarily just for mental health reasons. Um, so, but based off of what you you are currently dealing with right what we're dealing with okay. and just kind of i'm always interested to engage other creators who've been in similar circumstances um because we're still figuring it out dude everyone um, is i got three emails this week from people that are like hey as someone same fucking prompt uh i feel <laughs> i feel like people understandably are more at their wits end and in the pandemic a lot of people threw themselves into the work even harder yeah. and then as as we kind of get to what is hopefully uh a close whatever ends up being the normal <laughs> like people figuring out how the fuck do i pull back because this is this is how i'm operating now but it luckily people realize like that it's not sustainable um and i think that's the most healthy thing because no one can do it forever anyone that says that they can is probably trying to sell you something with bullshit hustle culture that and it pisses me like the the clubhouseification of like mm -hmm. of of everything it's like hustle 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 it's like yeah but you gotta fucking chill out one to enjoy it and then two to make it sustainable yeah but wait, yeah. so for your company how many people would you say all departments uh you have now uh all together we're like mid-20s i think nice okay yeah um and that, yeah, there, that ranges everything from uh, internal art for, you know, merch and any sort of graphics that we do for our overlay to people that uh, handle production and internal organization, marketing, stuff like that. We have an amazing team of people. Uh, I'm so thankful to have them all with us. Uh, so that's as important to us to have not just people that are good at the job, but they're just good people. You know, that, that to me is as important. Um, on the mental health note, I did want to say thank you for being so open. I think I, I messaged you about it as well. Being so open about just kind of struggles with self-image and sure. personal health. Um, I think it's something that men don't talk about enough in general, period. And, you know, I, I've i my entire life since being a young adult, I've, I've had a, been dealing with fairly rough uh, body, body dysmorphic disorder. And I've spoken about it a little bit before, and it's it's just I, it's very helpful to see people who have platforms and have audiences speak up about such topics and and help people know that they're not alone in these struggles and that it is as normal as it can be, not as strange as you would think, and that we're all working on it. So, well, I think it means a lot that you say it because I'm sure. Okay, wait. I'm I'm going to assume that ninety percent of the time that you mention it is it kind of quickly dismissed and people go, "But you look great." Yeah, yeah. And you're like, and that's it's not about that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's not what you think. <laughs> I'm fucking trapped up here, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, I uh, because because <laughs> yeah, because you said that, and instinctively, my dumb lizard brain's like, but you look like you, <laughs> like, and then of course, and that's that's fuck, that's part of the problem, yeah. right? Is like, because it's like, because someone feels like they can just throw a compliment, but that doesn't uh, address the full thing. And I, what I will say is it. Like when you say like, thank you for talking about it. And I know I did that on like the second channel. I, I look at that video and I'm very happy about it. I'm very proud of it. I'm, I love seeing the, the reaction uh, and people feeling less alone with something they've been dealing with. But even that video highlights something that I know that I need to work on. And that is, I feel more comfortable telling something, telling 300,000 people something than telling my dad figured out I was going through that because of that video, because it felt more comfortable to me for me to say it to like this family of hundreds of thousands of people that I've, that I've been able to kind of ride with for the past number of years than my dad. And that's not my dad. My dad's amazing. But, and so it was like, for me, like 
aside from the the initial reaction from that video, it made me kind of look inside and try and figure out <laughs> what it is co to connect to people. Because I would even say it's a, a problem. It's a different kind of problem I had like uh, back when I was running SourceFed. I was mm -hmm. more, I cared more about what internet people thought about me than what the people thought about me in the building. And it's so not like, then it was way more toxic. Now I think it's easier to handle because I'm talking about more sensitive things and it's not like how people are, <laughs> how people right. are feeling like I'm affecting their lives around me. But uh, yeah, I, I when you talk about like what I know you mentioned kind of in passing, what is this healthy, what we're doing? That's that's where I start asking questions about myself. Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting point of, of introspection. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a weird dynamic. Any being it's weird the current campaign we're playing through right now in in our game a lot of the antagonistic forces throughout the entirety of its narrative narrative have a consistent theme of eyes watching sure of like being able to avoid being watched by something beyond that you don't understand numerous eyes and things that are following you and i saw somebody tweet or message something online saying how i wonder if this is a projection of matt's comfort level with the the platform that he has. And I thought about it and I went, Oh fuck, I'm going to talk to my therapist about this. <laughs> and it's, and, and it's true. Like, like yeah. the more I think about it, the more I'm like, I think I accidentally projected a lot of my insecurities with being perpetually watched and judged and, and, and the, the continuous expectation you can't escape and made it the villain of our current campaign <laughs> in a way. So it's very unique to find out how the, the things you're doing for your job and media are reflections of things you need to start looking internally about. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Hey, it's me just interrupting myself again to shout out one of the fantastic sponsors of this show, DoorDash. You know, we all lead busy lives, whether it be because of long work hours, the emails, the kids, the laundry, the workouts, and the rest of our insane schedules. I mean, it can be very overwhelming. So why not take something off your plate and let DoorDash take care of your next meal? Ordering is so easy. Seriously, you just open up the DoorDash app, choose what you want to eat, and your food will be left safely outside your door with their new contactless delivery drop-off setting. And with over 300,000 partners in the United States, Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia, using DoorDash can support your local go-tos or choose from your favorite national chains. And on that note, right now, some of your favorite local spots are still open, but just delivery only. And that's where DoorDash comes in. Just open up the app, choose a local gem that you've been craving, and get your next meal delivered directly to your door. And right now, our listeners can get $5 off the first order of $15 more and zero delivery fees for your first month when you download the DoorDash app and enter in code DeFranco. It's $5 off your first order and zero delivery fees for a month when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter in code DeFranco. Once again, do not forget that code is DeFranco, my name. You don't know how to spell it, how dare you? DeFranco for $5 off your first order with DoorDash, just in case you didn't get it the first times I said it. Right before you go to sleep, you're gonna remember DoorDash, <laughs> code DeFranco. But that said, uh, let's get back to the podcast. All right. I'm going to I'm going to switch to some fan questions. So yes, and, I have, and I have one funny anecdote at the end. I'll tell you as well of, about that, about you, about me. No, tell me. I want to okay. know about me. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, it's a quick thing. A weird. Ex one of the weirdest experiences me and my wife ever had in this industry was about, I want to say, four or five years ago where we were asked by Felicia Day to to, to do something that she couldn't do, which was go to a, a casting call for the amazing race where they were bringing a bunch of internet talent Were together you there too? In the weird hotel in the middle of- Yeah. Of, yeah, up mm. in Studio City. I don't, I the only person I remember from that was Fousey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was, oh wow. But we couldn't talk to each other. They kept us all separate. And we, we, we intentionally, they're like, you cannot speak to any other talent there. You just have to share the same space. Like don't even make eye contact. It was the weirdest. But then everyone, uh, I felt like everyone other than me broke that rule. Cause like I was with my wife, we're sitting down and then it's like foozy tube <laughs> and like eight other people all talking in like a hot tub or a pool. And I was like, what the fuck is this is the weirdest experience because I was uh, because that was such that was a because you were, were you like locked in the hotel for like three days for three days. Yeah. A whole long experience. Yeah. And so they had to I had to like <laughs> talk them into giving us two hotel rooms and I was shooting my show down the hall in one and I would like drop a card off. My editor would pick it up, <laughs> edit the show there. Oh, and then wow. I was like doing other stuff. <laughs> and then me and my wife would be in the fucking, uh, 
in, in our hotel room watching old episodes of The Amazing Race. Uh, and then I remember, what was it? I forget what song it was, but we, we, uh, we found music videos and because, you know, they have challenge dance challenges. And so we were like yeah. trying to fuck it. That was the only, in my head, I was like, this is our only weakness. Fucking choreography challenge. <laughs> it's our only weakness other than being tired and probably screaming at each other from, from, uh, being so exhausted and traveling on no sleep. <laughs> and so it was a very weird three days, uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, you know who fucking took my spot? I, mm, who? Bernie Burns. Oh, shit. Because they, uh, <laughs> they tried to cast me as the older person, like, like the older married person. I'm like, I'm at this time, like what? 31. And right. they dress because they like, they, you know, you go through all the stuff and then they bring you to that, that fucking room, uh, where it's like, I guess it's like the final test. And we bombed it because they started asking me about politics and I started, I was like, uh, uh, uh. um, <laughs> but yeah, they were like trying to act like I was like 42 years old and it was so, oh, it was so bad. Like I thought we were going to nail it. And then we, we bombed at the end. Lin like, uh, my wife was so destroyed that we didn't get, get on that Aww. show. But wait, we, what, what was your experience like? Yeah. Uh, equally weird. It was one of the, in hindsight, we're very glad it didn't work out because a lot of things happened during the time they would have been filming that were like, we should have been there for that. Yeah. But we're thankful for that weird ass experience that you're like the only other person that I know who can relate to this weirdness being, being locked in this hotel, being put in the, the rooms and taking these like long aptitude tests. Did, uh, did they make you talk to like a psychologist? A psychologist. Yeah. And I'm just, just, I'm just like remembering this now. <laughs> <laughs> that was yep. so weird. Okay, you had yeah. designated workout times, but you could you couldn't be at like the machine next to somebody, and everyone would like stare at each other because you're remember, also supposed, yeah. you're supposed to talk shit about the other people there on camera, but we haven't met them, and it's like this is really gross and awful. And they brought us on to be like the gaming couple, and I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I mean, I'm a gamer, but I'm not. I don't have like a gaming channel. They, I could talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And so they asked about that and I started telling him and I could see in their face like, oh, no, this isn't working. Yeah, this this is this is a bad idea. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's such a it's such a horrible feeling, too, because I it's there are almost no scenarios where I feel like someone else in a room has power over me and or like can it, their judgment matters. And it just I think that also threw me off. But yeah, when you were talking about like the workout times, I remember uh we went in there and then it was, uh, Corey, uh, yeah, I think it was Corey and Tyler were like on the machines and it was right. It was, I feel like that show is why, uh, Tyler Oakley ended up getting so, so damn buff. <laughs> like he was just like, he just started working out every day. But, uh, but yeah, I was just like, oh shit, this is weird. Like I know Tyler, but wait, are we going to be competitors? And obviously we didn't get picked, so we weren't, but that was such, that was so weird. That was so weird. Yeah. I would still do that show though. I would still, I know, I know, uh, Lindsay still wants, like wants to do survivor. She, uh, she got a fire making kit last month. It might just oh, no be way. the, it might just be the <laughs> pandemic slowly wearing everyone down that they're like, you know, everyone's got travel hopes for after the pandemic. My wife has survivor hopes. <laughs> She's there like, this go. is what I'm going to do. But yeah. Wow. That, yeah. I didn't realize anyway. our paths like in that way, like crossed. Yeah, it was a weird thing. I I I remembered that as we were talking, I was like, wait, when was oh wow. shit, the, the amazing race thing. That's right. So yeah, anyway, I wanted to bring it up. We can God. do we can do questions. I'm sorry. No, yeah, yeah, no, you're great. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was like, they're a little all over the place. I'm gonna start with the light one because okay. because there were like 20 versions of this. Matt, what is your hair care routine? <laughs> oh, jeez. Do you have one or is it just naturally flowing? Uh, I do have one technically, but it's largely for uh, like scalp issues I've had since I was a kid. <laughs> You're like, uh, I use so tea tree like, oil. Yeah, well, I do. I have a tea tree oil uh, uh, shampoo now. That's the after part. But the first part is actually like a like my excellent like a, like a super like an, uh, a prescribed hair product. Yeah. I have to get from Walgreens pharmacy to put in and leave it for five minutes because otherwise I'm just a horrible flaky mess. Um, that's it. It's it's that and like, you know, tar based scalp stuff so science <laughs> so, so, so there you go science that's how science did it um <laughs> matt will you ever get into live action again i only saw a little bit of this on uh on your your website how 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 long did you do that very little yeah uh, you know when you start as an actor you're like live well, live action and then you do a few of them and you realize this is this is an awful industry in a lot of ways um 
especially when you're starting out and you go to the, just the large cattle call casting sure. you know, audition processes. And to your point of like walking into a room and somebody has power over you, and it, that, it, that is your job as an on-screen actor is walking into a room and having somebody look you at once and completely judge you from top to bottom with a glance and a, and a brief read of a script. Oof. And and then you spend the rest of the day thinking on, oh God, I'm worthless. So that, that squeezed my interest of being on camera out very quickly. And voiceover was definitely more my realm of interest. Um, but for, for me, it would have to be the right kind of project and the right kind of people. The few bits of on camera that I've done in recent years have been because they were friends who recommended me for projects that I thought would be fun. Like I did this series of films called Mythica. There were these like Mm -hmm. really fun, silly, low budget fantasy films that were shot in Utah. And a friend of mine, Jake, who I worked with in a web series was one of the leads in it. And he recommended me for the villain. And I was like, Oh, it's like a ridiculous arch scene chewing necromancer villain i'm all over this and i just jumped into it it's not a great performance from like a a cinematic deep standpoint it's a great performance from a like jeremy irons chewing up the scenery just having a blast standpoint and i had a great time um so yeah it would have to be something like that it would have to be like working with good people that people can vouch for and Mm -hmm. the project that i have time for and looks like a fun thing (laughs) because you need another thing (laughs) <laughs> you right, need another right. thing right now. Um, this one is less of a question and just says, uh, can you ask him to make some thunder sound effects because he is the best at them? <laughs> sure. No I one's guess. ever told you this? <laughs> sure, I guess. I don't know. There you go. <laughs> Hey, I told you this is completely different than everything we've been doing. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, Matt, uh, are you currently immersing yourself in any new hobbies? And if so, uh, could you share? Uh, but then they said they they also put a time limit on it. We're talking within the four months or so, Matt. Don't go five right. months or back. <laughs> You're right. I'm sorry. I hope. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I have, I have a lot of hobbies, but they're, they've a lot of their longstanding hobbies. Recent hobbies this is kind of weird the recent hobby that i'm getting into as in like the past week or so i finally arrived and it sounds weird lock picking mm. um i saw a, on a random youtube feed a video of somebody showing like a lock picking tutorial and i was like that's really cool i never really understood the deep like mechanics of the inside tumblers of different locks and stuff and it was fascinating and so i looked online they had like lock picking kits that come with like these cr- clear acrylic locks where you can see all the mechanisms uh, and tumblers yeah. and springs and i was like honestly i just want to learn it not because i'm going to break into places but for that one time in my life that we get locked out somewhere and we're like oh no what are we going to do it's too late to call anybody and i'm like hold on let me go to the glove box and just whip it open and i'll and i'll be happy i'll never have to do it again in my life but it's just a weird a weird skill that i've used in a lot of D games and such that i'm like i always wondered how it worked and i remember even in uh Elder Scrolls, you know, they have the little lock right. mini game. Like since then, I'm like, I want to kind of want to figure that out. So that's my new hobby. That makes sense. I mean, when anytime I come across those channels, it makes me it makes me realize like, oh, everything is available if anyone wants to take just a little time <laughs> to, to learn right. how to do this. Like <laughs> we're all we're all just on this like very thin ice. We're just trusting each other not to fuck each other over. Straight up. (laughs) Or maybe it just touches on the fact that, like, everything could go to hell if anyone had the drive. Mm. That's it. Let's see. Um, Oh, Caleb asks, uh, he mentioned working on a more solo narrative project back in early quarantine. I'm dying to know what it is or if it will come to fruition. And also ask about Omar. Oh, Oh, well, my Omar is great. He's probably waiting for me to get done in here and I'll go give him some scratches. Um, yeah, the solo project I was working on, we did announce it technically. One one of the things that we've been working on with Critical Role is our own publishing company called Darrington Press that Mm -hmm. we announced back in September. And so we have a a number of projects that we're working on. My quarantine project was a new RPG. We'll see if it's good. Called Syndicult. Mm -hmm. That is kind of like a a modern magic system where the idea, the theming of it is, is, you know, deep criminal syndicate tension in like a very urban New York type setting. But imagine if high, a high-ranking member of the mob was the first person to rediscover magic a few years ago and how that would kind of change the dynamic of secrecy and power within a, a balance of criminal syndicates. And so that was kind of the theming for it. And then I ended up having way too much time at the beginning of the pandemic to create a whole new 
dice system and oh wow i i went weird on it i we're just testing it we'll see if it's good yeah but uh hopefully people will like it that's awesome um okay Ooh. so matt what is one piece of advice uh you could give to someone trying to build a story um what, what would that advice be interesting um a lot of people think building a story is about building a world or like, you know, wanting to make things seem real. That That is a, an important part. But the good stories, the core is is the humanity. It's it's the connecting point the audience can have to a fantastic dynamic world or a story that's told in a cafe. You know, you want to think about what what makes your characters in this story human, what makes them feel passion? What are their desires? What makes them do things they wouldn't ordinarily do or agree with? What things do they fear and want to avoid? And, you know, the, these sort of considerations for any story help inform where the story goes. You don't have to plot out the narrative. If you build strong enough characters, they can largely guide where the story will go because it's a lot of them reacting off of each other. And then from there, it's just little bumpers. you kind of given them as, the, uh, and a lot of script writers will say the same. Um, so for role playing games, it's very much the same. Although characters, I, I more consider that for like NPCs and you know world narrative plots, and the players are the main characters. As long as they're bringing those aspects to it, it'll all fit together. Um, but that's that's my quick and dirty. What are there other um, are there other um, performative like D and D campaigns online that uh, you think are doing a, a pretty good job? Oh, there's there's and, so and, many. And what would and like if you could say three stand out. Uh, <laughs> What would they be? Three standouts, and I'm not uh, and I'm not saying that the other ones are garbage. <laughs> I'm oh, not saying oh, it. Uh, no, no worries. Uh, actually, let me make sure I. I'm going to go ahead and remind myself of this real fast so I can get to. No, the, you're good. I've I've been in like interviews where I just completely blank on something. I I'm like I know. Making who sure that I get is. I get the names right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I say off the top of my head, there is uh, my, Tr- Travis McElroy who taunted me earlier in this is wonderful team for the adventure zone from my brother, my brother and me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been doing great stories for years alongside us in the podcast realm. And they're, they're, they're great dudes. Uh, there's an RPG called into the motherlands that did their first season on Twitch with a, a number of good friends and all uh, POC cast and an incredible unique story in an amazing world. Uh, definitely check them out. Uh, it's, it's a, it's really, really cool what they're doing with the cipher system. Um, or cortex, sorry, not cipher. Cortex system. That's bad on me. Um, and then, uh, oh, there's so many. I don't. I, it's like picking children. Um, I would, I would say, I'm also going to give a shout out to my friend Mark Humes in the UK. They have a, she has a, he runs a show called High Rollers, which is kind of like uh, a, a more UK British based. Uh, RPG series, but they've been doing it almost as long as we have. And I've known Mark for well over 10 years and we're just big, huge nerd buddies from across the pond. And you should check out his stuff too. Those, those are my three off the top of my head right now. Awesome. When you're, so when, when you're going through a, going through a game, is there one specific player off the top of your head that tests you the most as a DM or a GM? (laughs) Yeah, that would be uh, Liam O'Brien, who is in our group. He he's the kind of person that likes to dig into the details of things. He's a very detail oriented person. So like we'll be in the middle of a, of, of a session where I'll I'll prepare like a grand narrative maybe where they'll go and they'll follow the story they've already been following to go talk to this important person and he'll be like, "That's cool. Is there a bookshop?" And I'd be like, "Uh, yeah, sure. There's a few bookshops." He's like, "Uh, what are they?" And I'd be like, "Uh, the there's the the, the nestle nook. There, there there's you know I'll say these these different names and such." And he'd be like, "All right, cool. I'm gonna go to that one real fast." Okay, what's it look like? Okay, well you walk inside and there's you know uh, incense burning in the interior. You can see the curtains are you know across the walls. A little bit of sunlight coming in. You see a frizzle haired woman in the corner with these thick glasses who's currently in the process of writing a book. And she looks up at you and talks. She's like, "Cool. Do you have any like adult books?" And I'm like. And she goes, uh, yeah, sure. And so I'm starting to make up names for adult books. He's like, okay, uh, what's this one about? And I'm just like, in my head, I'm like, you motherfucker. He is just, <laughs> he is just forcing, forcing me to on the fly, create a bookstore, create the interior, create the person who's running it and create smut and then recite the smut I'm creating. And yeah, he, d- he likes to do that. I do not have one remotely the imagination, but two, then the memory. If he ever needed to go back to this place, <laughs> I'm just like, no. <laughs> Not going to work. It's an experience. Uh, Matt, we kind of touched on this, but uh, Miss Yeti wants to know, how do you cope with the burden of responsibility that fame has brought? Uh, and do you miss uh, the days uh, when you had more anonymity? Uh, though I would say 
because I would say, what do you miss? Right. Yeah, I definitely miss that. <laughs> I I miss hmm. I miss a lot of things. I I I miss not having the constant knowledge that somewhere at any given point in time there are people that absolutely hate me right now <laughs> for whatever reasons they have. I just I want to like take this fucking poison that's in your brain and get it out. I know, I know, but it, but it's it's, it's I get part you. of my issue. I get, I've, yeah, I've for, been there. I think that's why I have that that like yeah. knee jerk reaction. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 hard for me. It's hard for me to think that that people I've never met that have never we've never had the opportunity to talk or get to know each other have have made up their mind that I am I am worthy of 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 stabbing and and throwing in the ground and you know and then I'm you know I've gotten death threats. Still get them on occasion. Uh, it is so crazy that- to be. I'm in like <laughs> such a volatile place, but it's the people that are in like these more like you wouldn't think it would get to that place that have to deal with it. Like, I mean, <laughs> knock on fucking wood for me, but uh, that's crazy. It's very weird. You, you you wouldn't think, but people have strong opinions about D&D sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, the first part of the question was... Oh, uh, how do you cope with the burden uh, of responsibility fame has brought? Uh, by trying to to use the goodwill we have to, to make a difference, if that makes any sense. I well, don't know if we'll it, achieve it, but it, like... It sounds like you want to leave the industry better than when you entered it. That's what yeah. it sounds like. Everything that you're talking about, whether, uh, you know, you're, you're pointing out that uh, a cast is all POC, or you're talking about crunch culture, it seems like you just want everything to be very inclusive and <laughs> just healthier. And yeah. that's what it sounds like when, you, when I, you're talking about it. I'm, I want to. It doesn't mean I'll get it right. And I fuck up all the time. I'm, I'm a flawed human being and I'm, I'm still learning as I go. But I'm, I'm doing my best and I'm trying my best to, to, to leave, leave things a little better than I found it. And that, you know, with initiatives with our foundation that we started last year, we have the Critical Role Foundation now. We've, we've f- took years to get up and running because mm-hmm. the government shutdowns and stuff kept making paperwork take forever. But, but now we're, we have amazing charity initiatives coming up. Um, with our publishing company, hopefully we can start taking projects uh, that are, don't get attention or haven't have a hard time getting published and maybe bring some of those into our wing. Like I want, I want to look back on what we've done with critical role and feel like we've made things a little better and made some opportunity for some really good people. And that, that to me is, is comfort with the level of responsibility that's on me. As long as we're working towards that, I yeah. think we'll be okay. Well, I love to hear that though. Cause like, I feel like influencer became the the word to talk about, uh, creators and but like what you're doing actually sounds like influence right you're trying to and versus most influencers these days not to just sh- broadly shit on everybody but it feels like you know you're more of a marketer you're just like selling stuff mm-hmm. right and so i think like i i appreciate you you saying that so actually what with, with uh crf what uh what what all does that organization do? Uh, we are a five hundred one three C. I think is the the phrase, and we uh, do different initiatives throughout the year. The first one we did was with First Nations, mm-hmm. um, which helped benefit a number of Native American communities uh, in the United States. And we create these initiatives that both tie to percentages of merch sales and for people to be able to donate directly to these initiatives. And uh, now we have a formal place to 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 put it, so we, we can, people can link it to Amazon Smile. If you have Amazon Smile, you can. It's one of the charities that are involved there now, cool. um, and it's it's kind of our way to because we've done charity through the years as we've done it, but it's always been kind of a piecemeal scatter shop. Whatever mm-hmm. comes our way, this allows us to have a centralized place to do it to engage charities with a more professional uh, level. And if Critical Role as a show and and everything goes away the charity can live on. Right. You know, as this foundation can exist far past the years that we ever make any content. And that to me was really important to us as the team was really important to, to build a foundation of the foundation that will outlast anything that we do content wise. Hey, I hope you're still enjoying the podcast or, uh, you're using me as a sound in the background, background, background. Don't know why there's an echo. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to thank uh, one of the sponsors of today's show, 
upstart. So credit cards, necessary? Maybe. A payment that you're overwhelmed by? Most likely. Most of us know that one, right? The statement that we're afraid to look at to see what the balance is. We've all been there at some point. Believe me, it, it is not a great feeling. So if you've been avoiding your debt, but you are ready to confront it, Upstart is here to help so you can face your debt and finally pay it off. Upstart is the fast and easy way to get a personal loan to pay off your debt all online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses. Over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple fixed monthly payment. And here's how it works. Upstart finds smarter rates with trusted partners because they assess more than just your credit score. The five minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans from $1,000 to $50,000. You can even get approved the same day and can receive funds as fast as one business day. So if debt is taking over your life, it is time to get a fresh start with Upstart. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to Upstart. That is upstart.com slash DeFranco. And don't forget to use our URL because that is how they know we sent you. Also, loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. So go to upstart.com slash DeFranco. But with that said, back to the podcast. If I put you on the spot right now, I was like, I'm just immediately switching past CRF. Sorry. Uh, okay. But you, you, <laughs> when we were talking about like your, who's challenging you the most and stuff, I started getting more of those questions in my head. Uh, if you couldn't do your if you couldn't head critical role anymore mm -hmm. who on the existing cast could take your spot uh i for 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 running the games yeah. you mean or just uh running the I'm, games? I'm like trying to say it as vaguely as possible because i'm so not in that right, world no, and i'm no. like everyone's gonna shit on me because i keep interchangeably saying words i think I mean, any of them really could. Most of the players have taken a spin at running a game, okay. and they've all they've all done a good good job. I think Liam, the same guy who fucks with me, I was mentioning earlier, he has the most experience since he runs games for his kids sure. often, and he's run a couple of one shots. Um, uh, he's probably the one who can pick it up immediately, but in time, I'm sure everyone else will get a little more experience too. So it's kind of hard to pick. But if we had to choose right now, I'd say Liam's probably the one who could easily step into that spot comparison to some of the others who would be like i know <laughs> <laughs> i love i love though hearing that he runs the games for his kids uh i think what was it i forget if he said it in the podcast or it was right after but uh, when i had john green on he was like mm -hmm. i love all the stuff that i do but like i'm going to 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 go <laughs> uh, play D D with my kids and like take them through the story and i was like Aww. how fucking cool that's so it. cool i'm like i'm i feel like a good father because i'm reading a book <laughs> 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 and like and i'm like we're, we're, we're playing uh we're like after we do this uh i'm gonna play uh the new mario that just came out together oh yeah but i'm like that that has to be like as a kid that has to be like the coolest thing oh man the Probably coolest thing enjoy tempering his language <laughs> oh no <laughs> that is i've never like the the genuine surprise in my voice uh, as I was playing it, he's never said that to me. And I think the uh, the clip that I shared doesn't include the lead up because I said, "What the?" And then he goes, "Fuck!" And I was like, "No, <laughs> son of a bitch!" I, if I don't acknowledge it, maybe I just I just misheard. And then he says it again, and then I was like, "Wait a second. And <sighs> of course, that happened the the first time I stream in like four years. It's yep. like. Of course, that's what happened. <laughs> of course, but at least at least it can be funny. And oddly, I thought I thought I was gonna get swarmed with oh, you're you're being a bad parent comments. And I was like, ah, oh, this is a little bit risky. Nobody, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's where that's where I'm in this nice sweet spot. There you go. Yeah, because like when we talk about fame, and I I think I've said it in other places, I I am in a very happy spot. Like <laughs> I'm not big enough in my field that like everyone's taking shots at me uh mm -hmm. and like and so it's like it's manageable because otherwise yeah i don't know i don't know how i would deal with it i don't know all right so we had fan questions we're going to switch over to this card game that i okay. you might be familiar with it'll hopefully let us learn more about each other and once again because you've watched the show there might even be questions that go back and forth usually it's just a one-way street so here we go okay matt what emotion can you tell I hide the most and how can you tell I'm hiding it? Interesting. I would say, I don't know. You're pre you're a pretty open book. Um, I would say you hide, I don't to get deep here. I'd say you, profound sadness. Oh, you tend, to, you, you tend to be, you mean you, you will express frustration and anger. Um, but you still keep a professional veneer to anything that gets to an emotional place for the most part. Hmm. 
maybe Just sadness. Yeah, maybe sadness. Definitely at the last at the end of last year, I was like, <laughs> once again, like kind of at my wit's end. I was gonna say I think it's anger because like uh, you can tell when I'm angry in the show. But I remember someone tried to like do a, a bash on me a few years back, and they're like, nobody knows how angry you are, and I was like. I mean, I am a very angry person, <laughs> but I was like, it used to run my life, but it's not so much. Maybe it is the profound sadness because there, there's, there's moments like, thank God it's not all the time, but maybe. What about you? What, what, what emotion do you feel like you, you shield? Uh, anger. Yeah? Actually. Yeah. I, I, I don't get anger often. I don't get angry often. I, I, I try to come at everything from a place of understanding, but when I get angry, when was the last time you yelled? Last time I yelled? Uh, oh, man. At a person or just in general? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, an out and just say in general. <laughs> in general? Um, I, th I think um, January 6th. I mean, mm. when everything went down to the Capitol, I was, I was a raving lunatic at my house. I was so angry. I was so in disbelief but also at the same time completely believing it the yep. way things have gone and just a lot of the a, a lot of a lot of the anger stemmed from from <laughs> profound sadness and uh and just i don't know a lot of things i was very angry that day yeah <laughs> okay if you could tell everyone you met one thing what would it be and why uh be kind to even the people you meet for but a moment. Oh, I thought you were like, even the people you meet. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, the person you're giving cash to at a gas station, the person that's, you know, filling your bag at, at a grocery store. Every person has a life. They have a story. They have mm -hmm. wants and dreams. And I think so often in this world, we only focus on the people that are in our inner circles. And so just engage everyone with kindness if you can. Yeah. Okay, so this question is, what's the closest you've ever gotten to someone and how did you get there? I'm going to change that question to how, what was the first interaction you had with your wife before, obviously she was your wife, like when you first met? What was that? We first met at a mutual friend's party, actually. Um, a friend of ours, Tracy King, who is uh, uh, working web production, doing web series stuff. And she had a little pool party and mutual friends met there. And we met and I was immediately like, she's wonderful. Uh, and it was great to meet her boyfriend. And, <laughs> and, oh, no. Yeah. And, and, you know, I myself was in a relationship. So it was very much like it was an attraction. Mm -hmm. but, but it was also like, we are, this is not even yeah. a thing. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we met and we were just joking and laughing and talking about video game humor and stuff. We were both big gamer nerds and, and, uh, yeah, it was just one of those like, that was a nice interaction. What a nice person. <laughs> and then, okay, and so where did it, where, what, what happened from there? From there, we kept in touch and we'd see each other at different social events. Um, we did, we were, we did some improv off and on with uh, Children's Theater Company down in, in uh, West Side. And I had just gotten out of a relationship, a long term, like five year relationship. And oh, wow, yeah. was, was, kind of realizing that dating in LA is a very scary thing. Uh, and then we started talking a bit. We had one evening where we just said we haven't talked in a long time. So we went and got dinner and just kind of caught up. And it was a great evening, a lot of back and forth. And she said, like, I just broke up with my boyfriend. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. We should, uh, <laughs> we should get a drink. How weird. And so, and so uh, a whirlwind romance took from there and three months later I was asking her to move in with me because I, I was an impatient dolt mm. and there we go. <laughs> and when was the, when did you, okay. I, I always get asked this question and I don't have one, but I always want to ask other people, did you have a moment where you were like, Oh, I love this person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really, really, really liked her. And then uh, on one of our, our first nights out, we just went driving and we just went driving along PCH and the moon was out and it was beautiful and we got into a lot of philosophical statements about kind of our place in the world. And we're, we're very different people. You know, I'm talking about like my kind of um, emotional openness and sensitivity. She is the gritty survivor. She is, she, it, you know, in the zombie apocalypse, she's the person, she's the guy in the front of the doom covers and the pile of two rifles going like, ah, like that's her. And so we've had very different life experiences and, and 
through those conversations about how different we were, we also realized how much we kind of needed somebody like the other person. And the more that conversation went, I was just like, fuck, this feels so right. And I can't, I think that was the beginning of me realizing I'm really quickly falling in love with this person. And how, how far into the relationship was that? <laughs> a couple <of> dates. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say anything. Sh- yeah. Yeah. I didn't say anything for a few weeks, but, uh, but that was when it first hit me. It was very quick and very rapid. And I was like, Oh no. Oh, okay. Let me just temper that and, and take things casually. And how, uh, how long did you date before you proposed? Uh, we were together for seven years. See, I think that's healthy. There's, there's so many people that rush into it like two, three years, which, Hey, everyone can do their own thing. But yeah. at five years in, I was having to point to like friends who waited nine years. <laughs> I was like, yeah. that? that's great. It's not that big of a deal. Um, wait, so what, uh, what, what made you go? Like, I want to propose to this person after, after being together that long. I mean, I kind of always knew mm-hmm. a p- part of, part of it honestly, honestly was financial stability, <laughs> um, and emotional stability, you know, um, we going into, into a marriage for whatever that means is, is a, is a transition that we both had discussed It's something we wanted to do when we were in a place where we could focus entirely on the joy of that. And we'd both had a lot of challenges about self-worth and kind of what we were doing with our lives, you know, her career being a woman doing web media on, on channels and the, the hate and the challenge and the, the hypocrisy and, and the, the grossness of, you know, the early 2010s web world in a lot of ways, she was, she was having a hard time with a lot of that too. And was kind of really trying to find something to make her own. And I, myself, while building a career in voiceover, um, you know, had its own challenges and a lot of dealing with rejection and things like that. And, and we were barely scraping by for a lot of that time. And so I think we just kind of wanted to focus on getting our life in order and to feel like we both kind of really found our footing as to what, who we are and what we want to do before we went to that next step. And it was through critical role really and her coming into her own as a creative director and being just a fucking badass at it. And, and once we had both gotten to a point of feeling more comfortable in ourselves, it was like, you know what? I think it's time. And how you, how did you propose? Was it like a just us sort of thing or was it people around you? <laughs> it's a bit of a story. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I'm a weird guy. So <laughs> I like any story that starts that way. <laughs> uh, I got some of my friends involved and about six weeks out from when I wanted to propose to her, we began going to, uh, thrift stores and like thrift antique places and getting plywood and a friend of ours who had an empty warehouse down in the middle, like about an hour South of us, we slowly built an escape room. Uh, like a, a, a cosmic horror kind of Lovecraftian escape room and had like this main chamber with all these, these different puzzles and stuff that she would have to solve that eventually led her to climb through this little uh, like AC grate and then walk into a ritual chamber where all of our friends were wearing dark robes and hoods. And there was like a, a, a ritual table with glowing lights and then the ritual would finish. And then a monster would come out from behind this like mask with tentacles coming out of the mouth and a giant tentacle arm. And so part of the, the escape room, she was assembling this dagger, which I, which I still have as a keepsake that glows red, like this kind of red glass dagger was made of, of plastic. And so we built it and we, a friend of ours invited us to an escape room right near Halloween to go ahead and, you know, uh, to go play this thing and then they get separated and then I get separated from her. So it's just her in the escape room figuring it out. And I'm on the other side, supposedly in another room of it, figuring things out and we're yelling to each other clues and stuff. And we're just watching her on cams. And then eventually right as soon as she assembles the dagger and stabs the monster in the chest, cause I wanted my wife to kill a, a terrifying beast to show that I love her. And, uh, then I post her. We actually, I, I recently uploaded the video on YouTube. Really? I'll, I got to watch this. Link. That's I'll amazing. That's, yeah, so that's that's how we did it. <laughs> I was like, I just did it in front of a crowd. That's amazing. That's like, yeah, that's theater work. <laughs> We're nerds. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, wow. Well, this, I don't even know if this is a hypothetical question. Uh, if you were isolated alone for a year. <laughs> oh, wait. Ooh. What about me would drive you crazy? Oh, I didn't read the second part of the question. It, it's, I'm asking you to criticize me, apparently. Hey, that's interesting. Um I would say in in a half hilarious way, how hard you are on your hair when it gets long. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it is. 
Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm hard hard to criticize you without any you know personal experiences. Um, I was like, because I'm gonna I'm gonna straight up attack you. It, it would I think it's endearing now. It would drive me crazy if you were this empathetic and sympathetic to like what I was feeling. <laughs> I'd be like, I'd be like, stop caring about what I think, Matt. That checks out. Yeah, is that is that, that a thing out. that you sometimes hear? Oh yeah, no, it <laughs> drives many people nuts. Even in our company, I, I can't tell you how many tough love conversations I have to have with like Travis and people that are like. Matt, stop it. There's nobody on the internet. You're fine. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You're right. I love it. We already kind of described uh, the first. Well, actually, wait, maybe it wasn't the first time. Uh, the time that you des- uh, you described, was that the first time you understood romantic love? Uh, no, I've, I've, I've had it before. I, this is the deepest I've had it. This is the deepest you've uh, had it, but yeah. The deep- but yeah, I've, I've, I've had romantic love before, you know, and I'm, I'm still friends with people I've in previous relationships with, you know, um, that's fascinating to people. me that I feel like that show is like fully fledged form human beings. If both people are able to do that, I've never been able to do that. But also like I've been with my, my now wife for over a decade. So all those people had to deal with like the worst version of me. So I guess that's not too surprising. Oh, okay. Matt, if heaven was a moment to be relived over and over again, what would your heaven be? Oh, wow. It would be probably me and my wife in our, we, for a honeymoon, we went to Malaysia, this little like resort, uh, and then we had this little kind of suite on stilts that was on the water. And we had the windows open in the morning. And so you just see the like, ocean around you. And, and it was just, it was, it was a very beautiful casual morning of us just like not having to do anything except just wake up and appreciate where we were. And so that would be it. I love that. What is the, what is the coolest thing you've ever done for any, or for someone else? I don't know. I, that, that, I feel like that's subjective on their end. Um, What's something you, you did for someone else and you were like, very proud of yourself, but maybe not something you would share unprompted because it would be like a flex. <laughs> um, uh, I, I helped a, a longtime friend buy a house that he couldn't afford. That's awesome. I feel like that's so. actually, that's like, I've, I've heard a number of uh, creators like that, whether it be like parents or like a, an old, old, old friend, which is dope. That's awesome. Good on you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're a good person. <laughs> How dare you flex on me like that? Uh, what is the uh, what's the wisest thing that someone has ever told you? Um, um, uh, they they were repeating a quote that I still hold on to this day, um, and the quote's been attributed to many different people, but it still holds true to me. Which is, uh, luck is when when pre- preparation meets opportunity. I think that's true. Uh, yeah. the, the the idea being that you know. Yes, there are situations of, of you know, privilege and, and the people have better chances of certain things, but a lot of things in life, it's not, it's being spending your time planning and preparing for the moment to arise in which you can prove yourself and seize the opportunity. And that really creates luck. I love that. And then, you know, we, we praised your parents, but what's a lesson that your parents taught you that you now know is false? Uh, <laughs> uh, do not handle finances like they did. Uh, <laughs> did they they use their finances on uh, experiences, not thinking about the future, or what? Uh, well, p- partially, and they're they're wonderful, wonderful people who uh, just they they don't know how to how to save money or or we, we I mean partially with circumstances, but mm-hmm. also they what, what little money they did have, and I'm thankful for it. They spent on experiences for me, and my brother. And, at, you know, when we got to adulthood, I realized that their my parents were still helping support them, you know, and uh, and I'm, I'm happy to do so. But I definitely learned things like how to do my taxes, how to build my credit back up because it was kind of shot mm. when I had to put all the family stuff on my credit cards um, when I was old enough. So, like, yeah, I, I learned a lot of financial responsibility by learning from their mistakes. So I would say that they're. Their input on how to be a fiscally responsible human being was false. <laughs> when you were uh, when you were growing up, were were you like more uh, middle class or where 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 did you kind of land? It ranged. There were some years where things were going good and we were kind of pushing a little more middle class, but then there were some years where things uh, jobs fell out and 
Uh, we had a period of time where we were homeless and kind of living out of our van oh, wow. uh, in hotel rooms. Uh, but I'd say lower to middle class. How, it, how old it, were you around that time? Uh, I would have been in middle school. I would have been like seventh grade. So like 12, 13. Did your friends know? Say? No, they didn't know. This isn't a thing you mention to your friends, especially at that age, because people just oh, tear you apart. Yeah, no, no one's, no one's, no one's, no one never describes a middle schooler as super empathetic. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so that's interesting. That makes me. So do you feel like that? So that. So I know that you were saying like the opposite of that. Do you feel like that specific moment forever changed the way that you view money? Uh, I think it it did in some ways. One, it reali- it made me realize, one, unfortunately, how much of our world relies on it mm-hmm. and the gathering of it and how broken that is. And also realized how unimportant it is for you to still enjoy your time together as a family. And ultimately, when it comes down to it, as long as you have each other, you'll be okay. You'll figure it out. You know, so like, yeah, I'm very thankful for those lessons. I do not look back in that time negatively if that makes any sense i look no, back on it as a that's huge a because i mean financial struggles especially to the degree that you're talking about i mean that's that's like potentially family breaking because a lot of a lot of people thrive when things are or are able to survive because it's comfortable like uh yeah, yeah. i mean i think i I'd, I'd be fine now because me and my wife know each other so well and like uh stuff like that but i mean early relationships in life constant stressor like it changes the dynamic oh yeah family stuff yeah, yeah. and, and it, we were lucky because we only had it for a short time yeah there are people out there that, that struggle with it for extended periods of time and are still struggling oh, yeah. with it and so like i've i have just an endless empathy for that and once again just how how broken our society is in a lot of ways yeah well on that happy note uh the the last question <laughs> that i'm going to ask you because you've been very giving with your time thank you for like the past two hours it's been really really fun because uh, this is like blast. also just us meeting. <laughs> so this, yeah, is, this, no, is, this is what I love. <laughs> um, what's a what's a piece of advice you could? Uh, and I'm prompting you for this, so so it's mm-hmm. not you just like unsolicited advice. Uh, if someone wants to be, I just from this two hours, I, I feel like you're. Even though I, I don't want you to care what other people think about uh, you as much as you <laughs> you you do, uh, you are a very you seem to me like a very fully formed and awesome human being what a <laughs> what's some advice you could get uh, you'd give to someone that that i don't know doesn't feel like they're they're where they want to be right now they're not the version of themselves they want to be i will say and this goes largely to to younger folk out there um so much changes in the short periods of time the older you get situations now that suck can very rapidly change uh, as long as you reach out and let people know that you're in a tough spot. Um, We have to rely on community now more than ever because as we're noticing and realizing the systems aren't in place necessarily to support us in ways that previous generations got to enjoy and uh, or, or the conversation around things like mental health wasn't there. So Things suck now. They can and will get better. And please don't be afraid to reach out if you need anything, whether that be just a shoulder to cry on, somebody to share an experience with, or to just ask for help. You know, it's, you're not alone. You may feel like it at times, but there are many, many people out there that are also looking for the same sense of community. And because of the internet, one of the good things we have is an easier way to connect that community. So just reach out. Beautiful. Thank you, Matthew Mercer. I appreciate you giving the time. Uh, yeah. This was great. And we're going to have to make this a one time a year thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure, buddy.